So now let's look at some code. Not there, in here. So I created, um, I'm sorry to everyone who is not a .NET developer, but I hope you can read this. So I created a very simple ASP.NET Core application, which has a very simple configuration and is completely empty. So I created the command API just to do the tests and I use Swagger to just test the API. So if I close the slides, I don't have more slides to show, to be honest. I hope you're happy with this. So if I go to host, 5, I need to run this, of course. So here we go. Um, that's basically a very small thing and it does nothing. So I'm going to um, continue and start adding stuff there. So I need to stop this application now. I'm not in dynamic language, so it needs to be compiled. And I'm going to work on some domain stuff. So let's say we have a simple entity for the whole booking, right? So let's call it booking. And remember don't let's get it. And I will just just for the sake of readability, I will enter the presentation mode. So what do we need to do in the booking? Let's say we want to, that's a proper domain entity. We can call it aggregate root or aggregate whatever. I just call it entity for the sake of not being involved with DDT that much. And let's say I want to keep the customer ID. Um, I will not use value objects. Just forgive me for that. I don't have time for it. And I probably want to keep them private. So I'll just say string customer. And I want to keep maybe the hotel ID. And I maybe want to have some sort of status. I will create an enum. Uh, and um, paid, cancelled, and that's it. So maybe confirmed. So I will have the booking status, and I will have whatever, maybe dates. And it's time. Um, from to. So, I mean, I don't want to make it very complicated. So, and then let's say I have, uh, when I want to put my first reservation or create a booking, whatever, like let's call it book the hotel, I would create a method that's called um, book. I don't know what to call it. Create booking. Ah, okay. I don't like create because it's cruddy, but still. So we would say we need the customer ID, and maybe we need first the hotel ID, and then let's say date time. Very easy thing. So what we usually do, we just say from, uh, from, and so on. So more properties. And what we do is let's let's go to um, the instruction, create something that I, I used to call aggregate store. Um, um, let's create an interface first, just for the sake of it. And it would have um, basically two methods. So 
store in load, right? So I would say that it's um, store and it will use an ID or it will have store of T, it's generic, uh, T entity. And then it will have a task of T load string. I will use string identity. I don't want to use ints or goods, whatever. It's just a string. Keep it simple. So, and let's say I want to create a, an API that would just do the booking, right? So I would say um, book. And I would say, well, let's say we want to create proper commands. So let's say I want to create commands. Um, and it will say have sorry for the typos. And so on, so daytime and stuff. And in the API, I would say that I need to do commands dot book. And I would just do something like that. So just bear with me. I'm not, I'm, I should create an application service. I know, but uh, just for the sake of it, I would keep it simple. So let's say public command API. And now I have access to the store. So I'm going to um, say, I suppose the booking doesn't exist. So I also need to have something like, they need to send me the ID. And I would say, okay. So I would create a new booking And I say booking dot, maybe I need to sign the ID first. Um, all right, and then I create this. ID and booking just create booking and it would be command hotel ID commands and I will need to create from two so here we go. And what do we do? And let's say this is not this. We will have um, a sync. Never return primitive times from the API. It's bad practice. Uh, you haven't seen me doing that. So store dot store booking. All right. Return. Done. So in, in a normal kind of state-based system, what I would do, and of course I need to write. So what would it do like if my aggregate store is MongoDB document database or SQL Server, I will create ORM stuff with the entity framework and I will create some tables, whatever, automatically, automatically. And then it will shovel this stuff to the table that's called booking, right? Or it will go to the booking collection and create a document. Anything else I do, like I will, uh, the next command I do probably is to pay it or confirm payment. I will just say, I call the method 
let's do that. So task, I will not return anything. Uh, confirm. Mm. Pay, whatever. And if I create this one, of course, there must be price and stuff like that. I just copied this one and say, all right. So, what I do, I would say booking. Load, booking, booking ID, and then I'd say booking, confirm payment, pay, and then I'll say await store, save or store booking. And I can create a method there. Yeah, that will just do like um, so state mutations are executed like this. So you call a method on the entity and say do that entity does it. So you have a proper domain model. Let's say like this implemented in code. So you express your intent with proper methods. It has behavior, it has state, it's fine. The only thing is that every time you just call store store, sorry for that, it overrides the state. So you, you don't know what happened before. So how you do it event sourced? Um, that's actually not hard. If we go and say that, um, Let's say we need a bit of infrastructure here as well. So let's create um, a class called, um, let's call it entity. It's basically a base class. And we want this entity to collect events instead of just mutating the state. So how do we do that? So first of all, we need to have some sort of list of changes. And let's make it private. So let's say a list of object uh, changes and every time you create a new instance of an entity it should be empty because there is nothing there no changes so i'm going to um to some of my code just to steal stuff so we save some time but i'm going to explain what i'm doing We, of course, need some way to get an idea, but I will do it later. And then we need to apply the changes. So how do we do that? So let's keep the changes at the end and put this method in here. So basically, we receive an event in this method so that we call apply. And every time we want to mutate the state, we will call this method. And we add this met this object. Well, yes, some something will come. It's a concrete class that will be coming, but they will all uh, inherit from an object, so I can safely use it. I add it to the list of changes, right? So, what is magical when method? When method is um, specific to the particular state mutation. So we will implement it soon, but now we just copy it. It's very simple. It has, it's just doing nothing at all at the moment. It's a um, abstract void when, uh, and it will be object event. All right, so all this apply does, it adds it to a list of changes and it calls the when. So the changes collection gets amended, but it's not being um, 
uh, query just yet. So that's why I see this warning here. So let's uh, do that thing in our booking. So return to the booking. Okay, so no, we need to do some events, right? So let's do a class called events. Events are part of the main model. That's why I'm not putting them to the application. And here we go. It's basically a sort of namespace. I like to do it this way. Thanks, Sergio, for this tip. And it will be the class called um, book. Uh, booking booked. I don't want to do that. I will just call it created. And I will have this almost the same properties as in command. So here we go. So if you worry about writing a lot of code for commands and events, it's not uh, that hard. It's basically sometimes it's almost copy paste. And let's do the paid events. Sorry guys, I I don't really pay attention to the chat just because I love you all uh, and I will try to read it, but now I'm concentrated on finishing this. So I will say, well, pay status. So we have two events and now in our booking class, what are we going to do? Well, we're not going to mutate the state in the methods. Instead, we're going to raise an event. So we call apply. Oh yeah, of course. And now it says, hey, look, I forgot the one and we will do it later. But now we just say create booking. So what did, does it do? It does this, apply new booking created and we put some properties in there. The booking ID is the ID. Um, hotel ID is coming from the parameters. From, from, to. All right, here we go. So nothing more than that. And now for paid, we do the same. It, it looks meaning, meaningless because you know paid, it should be some business be here. I'm just trying to show you the concept. So, um, so okay, so we applied it. And our apply methods, what does it do? It just adds it to the list of changes and call the when. So what our when will show, what do we do? Well, we'll fix it. So we will do the following. So we will use pattern matching to see what kind of events we got. And if it's booking created, we will say case. Um, then we can amend the status or the, the, the state of the our entity. So say, okay, here we go. It's the hotel ID equals events hotel ID. Sorry, Mac, customer ID, customer ID from, from, break. So now it will look like this. When we call this methods and our API hasn't changed. It doesn't know about, if your system is event sourced, it doesn't really care. That's why I'm saying transitioning from state-based management, state-based system to events or system from the API perspective, from application service perspective, is not as hard. 
because as soon as you have proper abstraction on your entity store, you don't really care how it's stored. Event sourcing is just a persistence mechanism. If you look, uh, if you remember a recent Twitter discussion, like if DDD doesn't work, only works with document store. It's, it's, yeah, it's a good joke. I really had a good laugh. So, not a single line changed here, but it will still work. And let's do the second one case it's a booking um, paid 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 status break all right then so when we call this method create booking for example it will call apply the apply will add it to the list of changes and call the one um, some would argue, why do you call when? Because you've still populated a list of changes and um, basically, why do you need to care? Why do you need to mutate the states right here, right now, if you just store events and then next time you load it, then you call the one. I'd say it's pretty useful if you just say, what if um, like, uh, from is more than, I mean, it's stupid, I know. Um, you can just do the validation, it's the basic stuff, but there might be more complex rule and you actually execute several things at once and you produce multiple events. So then you really need to know, you don't want to repeat all this logic in your, in that method, you, you might have some complicated events, reasonably complicated events, state mutations, and then you just need to work with, your, with, the, with the state of your object that, that is current after you applied an event. So that's why we usually, we always call it when in apply and it doesn't cost, it's like nanoseconds or I don't know what's less nanosecond or microseconds. It's, it's very fast. It's basically just executing a couple of assignments. So what did we gain from it? Uh, when we start persisting it, we will have events in our event stream and I'm going to show you how it looks like. And we are heavily over time. So what happens when we load this entity? Um, we need to create uh, an aggregate store that will use event store for persistence. So it's logically called aggregate store. And to implement I aggregate store. So, first thing we need to do is basically do that. So when we store events, it's pretty easy to do. You basically collect all the changes that you have in your entity and that's it. So we need to change an interface that it knows, um, no. This one. And the same here. All right. And we implement the constraints over there as well. So now we um, we can just go to the entity and you can see that my entity has this um, it needs a method, of course. The list of things here is private, so I couldn't get it from there. Um, but what I can do is basically, I want to um, hide my list just so nobody manipulates it outside of the uh, entity itself. So I can return the changes as a read-only collection to the store, the changes. Changes, yeah, here we go. So basically this stuff has all the changes. That's what you need to keep. That's what you need to shovel to event store. So how do we do that? Um, basically we have collection of object. We can, we need to serialize them, right? Because event store and any other persistence works with serialized one way or another serialized objects. It doesn't store objects 
it needs to have a representation of it. So let's just for the sake of simplicity, let's choose JSON and do that. So if I go to um, my stolen code, I will just copy it. But it's still pretty small. So of course, in my stolen code, I use aggregates and I'm not using it now. I'm going to import this and to the entity. And there will be entity version. Clear changes. So apparently we're missing something from the entity itself and I will add it soon. And I will tell you why. And I will also copy the get stream name method. Which is pretty useful. So when we store an entity, we need to know what how the stream name is composed. So as I showed you in the slides, I, in this case, I use the type name and the entity ID. And that's it. So you can say, I don't want to have uh, dependence on CLR types you want to, or whatever language you use. On the type name, you can use something else. As soon as the entity can tell the store how it's called, you can just deduct it, deduce it from the entity or make the entity produce a name for it. But here I go, here I use just a simple um, string concatenation. So the version needs to be there. And uh, it's basically just um, an end. And I also mentioned that in the slides, this is for add importance and optimistic concurrency. So we need to know where we are. And minus one is a default one because the first event you write is uh, the stream doesn't exist. So it has, you, the event you write will get version zero. And because it's incremental, you start with an empty stream and the version is minus one. So we have the version. And I use the get stream name entity dot uh, get ID. Apparently, I need to do that as well. So the store needs to know what ID it is. Therefore, I need to have this this method. And it's an abstract one, so the entity needs to tell store my ID is that. We could also create a sort of a string property in the base class. I usually don't do it just for the sake of encapsulation. So of course it now complains and it's very easy to implement like this. All right then, what do we have left? Um, it's a method and Yeah, of course, it needs the T. All right, so we want to clear, it's not necessary to clear changes because uh, if you follow the pattern of that, every command execution only does one, one write. So this is the, the best practice. This is your consistency boundary. You want to execute one command and do the write and get out from your API or whatever edge you use. Uh, but in case of just to avoid mistakes, uh, you don't want to keep doing something with the entity and then store it again and keep all, all changes. So you want to clear it when you store it. So there will be no changes in the array. So clear changes is pretty easy to do. I need to, yeah, it's here. I just need to clear the list. So what this magic is here, connection. Uh, here we go to the real instructor. This is this is why we are from event store. 
we want to use events to, right? So, um, first of all, event store operates with something called event store connection. So event store connection is a singleton. It's initialized once in the application. And as you can see, it's not initialized here. So I need to pass it to the constructor. That's what I'm going to do. And it will be what's trapped in the startup. Now, the connection doesn't have append event methods because it's a bit more complex. It needs to do serialization and stuff. So, but this is the essence of it. So you you have, you check if it's null or not, you get a stream name, you get your list of changes, and then you somehow store it somewhere in the store that can just add events to the stream. Um, I use extension method that I'm going to copy in a moment, just to simplify the, the code. So you can see that it's not that hard. It's just five lines of code, including throwing an exception. So it's not rocket science at all. So I'm going to create a small class. I'm just going to copy the whole thing. Uh, events to extensions. I'm going to spend a bit of time explaining what it does. And I need to copy event metadata. I don't need metadata, just I want to keep it to show it to you. So this is the extension method. It's also very simple and very small, although my font is large, so it doesn't really fit to the screen, but it's just 40 lines of code, including curly braces and empty lines I'm going to delete. Uh, and it uses json.net to serialize. You probably don't want to do that, but it's bloody slow, uh, but Everyone uses it, so I keep using it too. It doesn't do much. It gets a stream name, get a version, get a list of events. It checks if there are nothing to save, it just gets out. And uh, it event store needs to sort of in, put it in, in some sort of container. Every event puts, puts in a container that has a type of event data. Uh, it's very similar to things like uh, Event Hub, for example. It, they also use event data. Uh, I think it's called even like that, but we were first to call it event data. And it has certain parameters. So the constructor needs an um, event ID, which is since we generate new events all the time, it's just a new grid. The type, I use a CLR type. It's a bad practice. You need to map it to strings, but we're not going to cover it. It's more advanced stuff. Using CLI type is kind of fine for the start. And we just serialize an event and serialize event metadata. So just a brief touch on event metadata, you can put whatever you want. It's a dictionary. Uh, it's a basically key value, string to string. So you, you can put stuff like uh, when the command was received, uh, what is the, uh, the user identity that sent this command, you can Put a trace ID for if you do distributed tracing, a lot of different stuff in metadata. Metadata is something that doesn't have any business meaning, but it has value for, for the tech. So for you as a developer, and you want to have things like observability and stuff, you put it in metadata. Don't put this stuff in the event itself. Event just consolidates the business essence of the state mutation. So again, not hard. I can just shrink it to 10 line of code if I want to, losing some readability, and um, that's it. Just need to close some windows later on. So now we have everything, so we can actually store stuff. And if I just return task of T, um, what would I return? My T is not, I can't new it, so let me just use some codes to instantiate it and we will go and store it without using the load just yet. From results. Uh, so we'll just, it's a fake code, so don't look at it. I just want to make it work. So now we need to wrap it up. We need to, put aggregate store because it has a, our command API has a dependency, but it's not wired. So if I run it, dependency injection will 
complain and I'm going to solve it in a startup file by um, putting this dependency in the container. So I have the connection string in the settings file. So you can see it's going to connect to localhost with default credentials. Never put default credentials in production, although I know a few people who do that, myself included. Don't do it, don't look at me. So we have the configuration in place, it's nice. So I can just instantiate the connection. So how do we do that? Where is it? Here. So let's keep Swagger at the end. And here's my connection, right? So event store connection class comes from the client. Um, it is event store client API library on Nuget. So it has been installed here. So you can see here, I don't need Mongo, sorry. And this is it. So you need to supply a connection string. There are a bunch of ways to instantiate the connection. And we're working to reduce a number of ways to do that and document it better. But this is the simplest way and it will work out of the box. So let's say I call the connection webinar because then it will look nice in the user interface. And this is my connection. So what I'm going to do with this, I will instantiate a new aggregate store or entity store. Entity aggregate. I call it aggregate store. Oh, Jesus Christ. Aggregate. I call it entity everywhere. And here I call it aggregate store. And I just pass it a connection. So, and then I would just say services at singleton. No, I don't want to. No, yes, I want to do that, of course. At singleton. Uh, no, that's wrong. So, I... Right, now it's correct. So, I registered it, but it won't work. Why is not why won't it work? Because creating connection is not enough. You need to also tell it to connect. So it doesn't work like that. Uh, uh, it's configuration code, but also runtime code that will need to start after the configuration. That's why we don't do any kind of real infrastructure inside the config service method. Uh, people who work with .NET Core know that. At least I, I, I hope you don't. So, how are we gonna do that? So we need to open the connection at the start and close the connection when our application shuts down. So we're going to use application service or hosted service for that. And it's pretty easy to do. I create this one and I don't need any projections. Uh, hosted service. And I don't need any of this and I can just simplify it, I return in task, and here we go. So this is the very easy hosted service. The only thing it does when the application starts, it starts to open the connection to you using connect async method, and when the application stops, it closes the connection. Now it will work when we register the hosted service. So I just say services, at hosted. And you see it needs the connection. So the easiest would be actually not do that and use the dependency injection magic, which I don't really like, but in this case it's pretty useful. At singleton AS connection. So you can see ES connection has a type of Ivan's store connection. Now I can say services at singleton. Uh, what's it called? Uh, I aggregate store, aggregate store. If I'm not mistaken. 
set to service T implementation. That's okay. Otherwise, it will complain anyway on the runtime. Yeah, and I need to add hosted service event store hosted service. Now it should work. Let's see. All right. So it somehow missed the swagger, so I did something wrong. Support and biggest. Oh yeah. I guess I made a mistake in API. So it has a book and pay and it has probably no uh, HTTP post and it has route pay. Let's see if this works now. There we go. All right, so let's do the book stuff. Um, try it out. Working ID one, two, three. Da, da, da. And it won't work for the simple reason that it will blob. And the reason for that is if we look at the error, is that it tries to append to stream and it doesn't work for a simple reason that the connection uh, cannot be opened because I haven't started event store. I could say this is intentional, it wasn't, but that's easy to fix. Event store uh, webinar. And I will just do Docker compose up. All right. So you see a lot of stuff. There is also MongoDB, which I use for projections, which we can do in the next webinar. And now I'm going to execute it. And here we go. Everything is fine. And success is success. And let's see what happened in Event Store and have a look at Event Store itself. So local host. And if you remember the default credentials, I do. This is how it looks like. We don't like it too. Sorry to those who worked with Event Store and don't like this dashboard, we're going to fix it in the next version, but so far so good. We're going to just use, and I can't, what can I do with that one? Q and A thing. Ah, it's stuck, okay. Yeah, it's gone, all right. So a lot of things are going on, but we're not going to look at it. We're going to look at the stream browser. And here we go, I recently created streams, booking one to three, booking created, this is our event. Off you go, everything is here. So this is our metadata that I put there, the full CLR type, just for, for to put something there. And this is the event ID, the new GUI that we generated and whatever else we want, everything is saved. Now let's do the payment stuff. Uh, let's let me check if uh, it actually is implemented. So I go to the API, pay blah blah. Good. So ah, of course it will blow up because I don't I haven't implemented the load stuff. So we can create as many bookings as we want, but it wants. Uh, be able to do anything else. So let's do that first. Um, all right, so load. Oh, 
of course, it, no, it won't blow up because it will return an empty entity, but that's what we want. So what we really want is to actually load stuff. And we're going to do it. The load method is actually pretty nasty. I mean, it's, it's not that bad. It's still just a few lines of code, but it's a bit longer than to save. So. I need to fix some stuff. I really do that quickly. Mm, I guess stream name of. Yeah, of course. Uh, and this is basically it. So let me make it async. So if we go through this, don't ignore the errors. We just throw if we get an invalid argument, we get a stream name using the same method as we used in save, so it will turn the same thing. A use reflection, you don't need to do that. You can just say my my entity can be newed by calling constructor. Um, then you read events forward from the beginning of times. So this is the stream name, this is the initial position, which is zero. This is the maximum page size to read is 1024 is basically 1k events. And this parameter is called resolve link to. Uh, we don't need to discuss that now. And this is it. The issue with that code, if someone has noticed, that it only reads 1024 events. And if your stream has more events than that, first of all, you probably need to do something else, like snapshotting and stuff, but it won't actually load the whole thing. So if you have long streams, you need to implement paging. It's pretty easy to do just a normal one while stuff. So the page actually returns you if it has more events. Oh, page dot is end of stream. So you can just do the while and read it and it has next event number and stuff. So in some of, of the webinars, that will happen later. We can go through this and implement it properly. That's good enough. We only have one event at the moment, so we don't need to page anything. So apparently I'm missing two things. Result event is something that events to return to me. And it's of course the property bag that contains just um, binary arrays for data and for metadata. And it has some properties like event type, version and stuff like that. So we serialize it when we saved, so we need to deserialize it when we load. It's pretty logical. So I need to just copy this stuff. It is extension method you can see. So I'm just gonna copy the whole thing. Um, nothing fancy, deserialize metadata, get the data the, uh, type of the uh, the CLR type of the event from meta, because I'm not doing anything else. I'm just doing it straight simple. And deserialize the data using the given type over here. So I use deserialize object. This is a string from binary array and we return an object. Straightforward, nothing fancy, usual serialization, deserialization stuff. So now we, solve that one and then entity load Lo entity load is a bit more interesting so now we need to we write we have read the whole stream of events let's say we read 10 of them and then we need to restore the entity to current state as i mentioned in the slides we need to apply or like do the state mutation for each of those events it sounds scary but it's really fast because you see in this when method it's very small so the entity load method is also pretty straightforward. And it can be put in the base class because it's the same for everything, for all of this derived classes. So here we go, that's it. So this is the essence of event sourcing. If you look at it, this is the left fold that Greg's talked about so, so many times get all events and apply one one by one, increase the version. So when you put a new event, it will have a proper version, the current version plus one, and then plus one, and then plus one. So I don't know what can be simpler than that, nothing. I think it's pretty straightforward. 
So when you receive one event now that's called book and create it, and you have one element in the collection, you call it when, the when will say, okay, let's go here, book and create it, it will maintain the state, and that's it. So this is all event sourcing, to be honest. So let's go to aggregate store. All our methods are now implemented, so we can do the paste stuff. And of course, I need to restart it. So let me just go out to the presentation mode. Oops. And stop it. So here we go. We run it. And it will open Zago again. I don't need it. I have it here. And our what was that? One to three. So let's try to do bad stuff. So let's try to say booking ID is two, three, four, and pay this true. I execute it and it should crash. And it did. So mm, yeah, I need a constructor. That's it's crashed, but for the different reason. Let me do the constructor. Oh, it needs an ID, right, right, yes, yes, okay. So I will do it like a private one. Let me just double check with the event, with aggregate store. What does it use, Chris? Yeah, it should be fine. Looking. So let's try it. All right. Looks good. And it worked. It shouldn't actually work because it should crash because it couldn't load it. But maybe I made a mistake somewhere. So let me see what happened in the stream browser. Yeah, booking with empty ID. Yeah, right. So I should have checked in my API if the entity that I return actually exists. So in here, what I do, I create a new one, and then it just reads a stream. It, it doesn't check if the stream actually exists. So it just says the entity is there. I created it. So I get stuff, and I try to load it. But because stream is empty, it's fine. So I could check here if the page is empty and throw. I can do other things. I can create an exists or new property on the entity itself. I can also compare the version. So I can say in the booking here, uh, in confirm payment, for example, if version equals minus one, I can create a function that will do it. So I'll just say throw. Operation exception must exist. It's not the best way to do that. Uh, I advise you not to do it like this, but it will do the job for now. And why then? Just do it again. And now it crashes, so it says must exist. So that's cool. And we say one to three, execute. And it goes well. And if you look at the stream, stream browser, huh, I messed up. And I know where. So, what you probably can guess. So, if you look at the stream browser, it doesn't get a proper ID because the ID field is empty when we load it. So, what we need to do in here, in when, in the booking. We could have done it in the constructor as well. So we could separate creation of the booking and the actual factor booking by like, you shouldn't call the constructor. You say, use the static factory methods that will also generate an event that 
indicates that a booking has been sort of draft booking has been created. And then we actually do that. It's something like oh, the act of booking. I just don't like the book booking booked and stuff like that. It doesn't sound nice. So maybe I need to choose another domain for the demo, but it's very easy to solve. So just say ID equals events dot booking ID. And that's all I need to do. This is how bugs in the event source system usually solved. I, of course, ID bug is very nasty, so you don't really need to do that, but say it's another field uh, and somehow it got messed up. By fixing the implementation of the man method, you fix all the logic also that happened before. So everything that starts now after you deployed a new version will actually work correctly if you change the logic because as soon as your events were saved correctly, uh, no matter how messed up the state mutations are, it will actually start applying the state mutations properly as soon as the new version of the application is deployed. So let's try to do it again. Boom. So I guess it's 200 OK now. So this stream doesn't get populated with anything new and nothing happens here. Did I even run it? Yes, I did. Oh. So what happened? It's the demo effect and it couldn't all go well, right? So let me just go like this and click here and it crashes. Oh, I think it doesn't, <laughs> it's not running. That's the simple one. There is no bug. So I'm getting tired of the track of windows. Now, yes, something happened because before it was just refreshing the page. And here's the new event, we can pay it and everything is fine. So as you can see, it actually got um, the booking ID correctly and stuff like that. So I can easily prove to you that when you call the payment methods, it actually gets the status or the, all the properties populated. So the state has been, state mutation has been executed. If I do it again and I get here, so you can see that the customer ID is one, two, three, hotel ID two, three, four, the ID of the booking itself and its payment status, everything is properly populated by calling the, pre, the ones on the previous event, the historical ones. So it all works nicely. So that's basically the end of the demo. We managed to store stuff, or we managed to load it back, and we basically built a very simple event source application in rather limited period of time. I could also, let's see, the status is not set, right? So it's, it's clearly a bug. What I do in the state system, I would write the whole bloody thing to just go there and correct the status in my table that contains a minute in the records. Here, I wouldn't do that. I mean, if we go to the read side of the projection, that's probably required, or we can rebuild the projection. But uh, here, it's pretty easy to just say status. Um, no, I need the status. No, I don't need the status, right? So just go here, say status booked. And here I would say status uh, paint. All right. So um, I should have created the application service that probably uh, a nice topic for the next webinar. Um, now I'm calling this from the API itself. It's not a best practice because if, as soon as you move to another sort of APIs, you need to rewrite the whole thing or copy paste a lot of code. It's nice to have it an application service because you might go to messaging, whatever else. But it, the essence of it is that this interface is extremely simple. It loads and stores stuff. It, it's not a repository, right? So it doesn't represent really a collection of your 
whatever else entities or aggregates. Uh, it doesn't work like that, but it has it has no ability to query anything. It just can do two things: it loads and stores. And you can implement it in many different ways. You can do document database, you can do ORAM, whatever else, but just as well, you can do it in event source way. But of course, if you do it like this, your application doesn't change. So everything stays the same. The methods are the same, at least the calls and stuff like that. But inside, instead of using state mutations directly in the method that represents the behavior of the entity, you do differently. You do apply of the event and it gets added to the list of changes. And then you need to have a when where all the states, state pieces are mutated. So that's basically it. And the magic happens in this low load method, which is here. And as I said, this is the, the, the essence of event sourcing as it is, just loops through all events and call the one method. So easy, 